So, yeah, I am going to be um, kind of summarising some of the findings that um, I've got from the PhD study that I'm doing. Um, the study's taken me quite a long time to do. I started um, my PhD research in 2010, um, but uh, two children and three jobs later, I'm still at it. But now, at the point where I'm about to, um, I'm just writing up for submission, so it'll be submitted by the end of June. So these are very kind of like of the moment findings. So you're very privileged to hear them at this stage. Um, so uh, I'm going to start us off with um, a quote from one of the participants. Um, I was really privileged to do these interviews. If you've never done um, kind of qualitative research, um, it's just amazing to sit in the room and listen to people talking about their experience of, um, of something that actually from my point of view I thought I had a lot of experience in but then being able to ask um, patients and practitioners about what their experience was was just um, really enlightening and interesting um, and I was also really um, thrilled at the because uh, I mainly focused on young people um, their ability to talk about it as well. You know, my fear was that I'd get these kind of monosyllabic answers or I don't know and all of this sort of stuff. But actually, um, they were all kind of talking away about their experience of mindfulness for kind of 45 minutes to an hour. And um, so I was able to get quite a lot of data from those interviews. Um, so this is uh, Philippa, one of the um, young person participants. She's 16 years old. Um, so I'm, and she says, so I'm just looking around the room at different things, and I was just sitting there. I was just like, why? What? What? What's the point in this? We're just sitting here doing nothing, listening to some recording that just makes me laugh a little bit. Um, and and this kind of brings out a couple of things. So in IPA research, we're kind of um, having a look at what people say and trying to make them focus on the meaning of it really, and seeing whether there's meaning, um, similar meanings across. Um, different participants or whether there's differences, those sorts of things. But uh, this quote kind of shows us one of the things that came out quite a lot. Um, and it's the kind of, what's the point in this? Um, and uh, patients um, found it very difficult to um, be told about mindfulness and then being able to relate that directly to what their difficulty was. So there was a lot of things around kind of like, yeah, but I'm telling you that I'm going to kill myself and you're telling me to look at a coin. <laughs> or you're telling me that, you know, I'm telling you that I'm just utterly distressed and what you want me to do is sniff a Pringle. You know, it's just, and, and they find it really, really difficult to make any kind of um, relationship between these two things, especially in those initial stages. And for those patients that were able to kind of get over that kind of, or I don't understand what the point is and give it a go, they did start to find some use of it. Um, but there did seem to still be some, I'm not really sure what the point is, going on. Interestingly, that was very similar for practitioners. Practitioners mm -hmm. also had difficulty in explaining to patients what difference mindfulness was going to make to them and, and making it very clear. Some of them were more confident at doing that, but some, and mainly those that had less of their own personal experience of using mindfulness, really struggled to have the confidence to say, we're teaching you mindfulness, we're teaching you mindfulness because it's going to be useful to you and this is why it's going to be useful to you. Um, the other thing that this quote um, that I've used it for is that it, it shows us something a uh, little bit about um, another block to using mindfulness, which was self-consciousness and embarrassment. Um, so she's kind of saying, you like, we're just listening to something, it's making me laugh a little bit, I'm being a little bit embarrassed about this. And actually there was a lot of um, things that happened when people um, started to practice mindfulness that made them feel silly, made them feel um, kind of almost ashamed of themselves, those sorts of things, and that was something that really came up as well. So I'm just going to track back a bit now. Um, so and I'm going to go through um, why I chose to do mindfulness and DBT, a little bit about the research method that I did use. <coughs> um, 
some of the findings, the indications and the limitations of the study as well. So why mindfulness? So um, DBT, Dialectical Behavioural Therapy, has been around for quite a few years now, started out as a treatment for adults. Uh, with borderline personality disorder. So focus mainly on things like emotional regulation, um, tolerating distress, um, in, uh, interpersonal effectiveness, getting on with other people, um, and mindfulness being kind of the fourth module in, in, the, um, in the therapy. It has been adapted for adolescents and is being used more and more widely for adolescents. Um, but the DBT treatment as manual is a lot rarer than kind of we'll do a bit of a group or we'll do a bit of a group and they might get a little bit of individual work. The full DBT programme is individual work, group work, phone coaching and um, consultation to the therapist as well. Um, but also mindfulness outside of DBT is... Um, around and about and being used quite widely as treatments. Um, there are research papers about you know, treatment of OCD with mindfulness, treatment of ADHD with mindfulness, treatment of pretty much any mental health disorder. People have kind of gone, oh, I wonder what would happen if we taught these people mindfulness if it would make a difference to them. So it's being, um, mindfulness is becoming quite widely used and also not as a treatment as well. So it's being promoted. There's a paper, um, a government paper, um, which is um, suggesting that mindfulness become kind of common practice in prisons, schools, occupational health, pretty much everywhere. So um, it feels like it's becoming a little bit at risk of being a panacea without kind of necessarily completely understanding um, what's going on with it. Um, so I found that um, mindfulness, as it was in DBT, um, wasn't particularly well studied. So the way mindfulness in DBT is taught is quite different to some of the other mindfulness-based interventions. Um, in something like um, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is MBSR, or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is MBCT, um, they would um, be doing mindfulness meditations for around about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, something like that. So quite an extended period of time. DBT, we do around two minutes. Um, we would do two minutes of a mindfulness exercise that would um, illustrate something about mindfulness. So we might do a mindfulness exercise that will um, illustrate how we might observe a situation or, or how we might be non-judgmental about a situation. But they're very, very short exercises as a way of illustrating. Um, and interestingly, <clears throat> um, what the, some of the findings from this research were that um, people weren't uh, seeing those exercises as illustrations, they were seeing those as examples of what they should be doing. So they was, that's why they couldn't quite link things up, because they were seeing that, well, in the session, we looked at a coin. Therefore, when I'm distressed, I should look at a coin rather than being able to transfer that over and say, what I learned was that I can observe something, and when I'm distressed, I should observe what is going on. So that kind of leap wasn't particularly happening for the patients that I spoke to. Um, I also um, was well aware that in the kind of research, there were kind of all sorts of mechanisms for mindfulness that were coming up. Um, so these kind of included things like, or oh, maybe people are um, benefiting from mindfulness because it improves their psychological flexibility. Maybe people are um, benefiting from mindfulness because it's reducing illumination, because it's helping them to um, kind of not react to urges, uh, because it's um, helping them to have an emotion and not react to it. There's, there's probably about 20 to 30 30 different mechanisms of mindfulness that people are, um, are uh, researching. So it's a huge thing, and actually there's not complete agreement about what we're talking about when we say someone being mindful or not mindful, or what, what the um, absolute necessary things are to say that this is a mindful experience. There's not a 
complete agreement about what that is. And there's also um, a lot of kind of tension between the state of being mindfulness, so I am being mindful, and the trait of being mindfulness, so I am a mindful type of person. Um, so <clears throat> such a wide, 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 wide range of literature, believe me, doing a PhD, you have to come across a lot of it. Um, and actually, not an awful lot that told me, well, what's going on in DBT when we're doing mindfulness. Um, and it has been subject to qualitative research in other mindfulness-based interventions, um, but it hasn't been subject to qualitative research in DBT. So I chose interpretative phenomenological analysis, and for the purposes of this, I'm going to call it IPA, because I don't like saying all of that. Um, so IPA um, lent itself well to kind of answering the question I had, which was basically, well, what is it like? You know, we're asking people to do this. Um, we're asking practitioners to teach it. We're asking patients to do it. Um, but what is it actually like when they're being asked to do that? Um, so uh, let us work to that because it is focused on a phenomenon. My phenomenon was mindfulness and DBT. Um, it's also um, ideographic. So, you know, I wasn't going to be able to find out everything about mindfulness and DBT for everywhere. I could only do it for the people that I was talking to. So I wasn't looking to come up with um, a model. I wasn't looking to come up with um, any kind of generalised theories around it. But what we can get from IPA is kind of looking at the resonance with what else is going on out there, what it, how it fits in with the rest of the research. If there are any differences that are coming out from these experiences that I perhaps wouldn't have expected because of the research um, that has already been done. Um, it's also interpretative, um, so um, very much keeping in mind that the outcomes of the research are very contextual. They're contextual depending on who you speak to, and they're also contextual on me. Um, and what I pick out as being important from, from what I've read. Um, so as a researcher you're kind of, in IPA, you're kind of, you do have options about which route you go down in terms of what seems to kind of be important. And you cannot possibly um, follow every single kind of thing that someone says. So you're looking at kind of like well, what is said across the board. What, what seems to be kind of something that keeps on coming up, um, what um, kind of gives me an idea of what is really important about this experience. So, like I say, I, I started off and the initial title was going to be What is the Adolescence Experience of Mindfulness and DBT? Um, however, um, there were some uh, recruitment difficulties. Um, mainly in terms of actually accessing sites to recruit from, um, I, uh, partly due to uh, local kind of procedures for gaining approval. Even though I had ethics approval, there were then extra local procedures for gaining approval, um, and and then you know most camps teams won't be working with all that many young people in DBT at any one time, so. We ended up extending our sample to include some adults, but in the end we actually only ended up with two who were in adult services, one of whom in some definitions would still be considered an adolescent because she was 22, um, and in some de definitions it kind of goes up to sort of 25. Um, so I kind of had this one outlier um, who... Um, Interestingly, it was quite different to what the other people said, but we'll come back to that later. Um, so I had four sites in the end. I had one adult site, um, and then three CAM sites. And they differed slightly in um, what they were offering. Um, so site A was the most comprehensive, did the full DBT programme. Um, and you know, all these others kind of 
some had groups, some had group individuals, some, but then within those, the, um, the actual participants varied as well. <coughs> Number of oh, sorry, yeah. Practitioners recruited. Yeah, so um, practitioners recruited from the same sites as, as the young people, but they weren't associated with those young people. That, so they weren't, so the, the practitioners were talking much more generally about their experience. It wasn't, so I did eight patients and eight so practitioners. Almost as a control? Uh, no, not as a control, no, just as. Yeah, just different different perspective on the same issue, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so, findings. Um, so the process of analysis is that um, we, I um, coded the um, inter research interviews with kind of um, things that just kept on coming up. They were then... Um, drawn together to see what themes were for those individual participants. So each participant had their own themes. And then the themes for all of the patients were kind of looked at with regards to one another. Um, and that gave me um, my subordinate themes for that data set. Um, and from that I was able to kind of think, well, how do these group together? How, how um, what does this tell me about the experience? And then I came up with some superordinate themes for each data set. So I had a, a set of superordinate themes for patients and a set of superordinate themes for practitioners. And then I used those to then come up with these um, higher order concepts. So these speak to the experience of both the patients and the practitioners within the research. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm just going to take you through um, kind of the, the main issues regarding these high order concepts. Um, but I'll start you off with a quote for each one. Uh, so this is Tara, again, a 18-year-old um, uh, participant. Um, and she had done a group only program. Um, and this was uh, talking about uh, someone who had asked, you know, she was telling about mindfulness and she said, she was like, why? But why? Why would you do this? And I said, because it helps. I don't know. I don't really, because I know what it is, but I can't describe it to someone. And I know why I do it, but I can't. It's difficult to kind of tell people. Like, when they told us it didn't, I didn't really understand, but through doing it, I started to understand it from my point of view. And I think that's the only way anyone's ever going to understand. So a bit like Philippa at the start, there's this kind of, I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite sure why I'm doing it, but Tara kind of moved on a little bit from that and was able to say, but I kind of gave it a go and, and something happened, but I'm still not quite sure how to describe that. So this whole idea of there being a spectrum of uncertainty is that, um, across both patients and practitioners. Um, some stay very much at a, a point of being completely unconvinced and um, completely disengaged from the idea of mindfulness um, to being kind of wholeheartedly convinced. Um, so Maria in particular, she was um, the outlier in terms of age, she was 50, she became almost evangelical about mindfulness and that's why she wanted to be part of the study to tell people how amazing it was, but then I had kind of Sam at the other end who was kind of going, yeah, I don't really, yeah, she said very little other than, I'm not sure really, it's really hard to explain, yeah, I don't really understand it. Um, so in terms of um, what really came out of this high mind theme, Already said about what's the point, um, but there was also a sense of um, being unsure whether they were able, like, uh, you know, perhaps I'm just not the right sort of person for this sort of thing, perhaps I'm just not cut out for it, um, perhaps other people could do it, but there's something different about me. And practitioners, similarly, were kind of like, maybe people can't do this, maybe we're asking too much of them, maybe. Um, you know, they're, 
they're too immature, maybe they're um, too emotionally dysregulated. Um, so a lot of kind of uncertainty that any of this could really make a difference and that there were an awful lot of blocks for them. There were an awful lot of things that made it really difficult for them to keep going with mindfulness because um, there was a sense from both practitioners and patients that mindfulness is a really tricky thing to do, even if you're really up for it, even if you really give your you know, time to it, it remains a really tricky thing to do and inherently seems to have um, difficulties that you have to overcome in order to um, keep going with it. Um, and one of the things that um, I was really aware of when I was hearing um, participants speak about this and this kind of idea of it's just so hard, I'm not sure why I'm doing it, I'm not sure whether it's even necessary to get a good outcome, um, that there was quite a sense of should and I'm not good enough and almost kind of inciting shame in them that like I'm being told that this is going to be good for me and yet I can't do it, so what does that mean? Does that mean I'm not good enough um, to do these things? So, um, let's move on. So, uh, shifting perspectives from a difficult situation. Um, so this is from Philippa again. Um, and she's kind of saying, because life is, as I've said many times, life is hectic and sometimes we can't get away from it, but we can use it with um, just sitting there and just blocking everything else a bit and just focusing on just one thing. It's wonderful really, just knowing that it's not exactly an escape, it's just more of a pause button on life for a bit. Um, and this kind of higher order concept, the shifting perspective, um, really uh, sort of started to link in with some of those mechanisms of mindfulness that, um, that the research was talking about. Um, because what people were doing was a very specific thing and what people weren't doing was very specific. So what they described doing was um, using mindfulness to really focus their attention somewhere else. So they did not, um, it's one of the things that we say when we're teaching mindfulness is um, you, you're mindful of the present moment. Actually people were mindful of the present moment. What they did was they said um, the present moment is really hard, I'm going to focus really hard on something else for a bit until it feels a bit better. So they chose to use mindfulness in a way that really focused their attention on something else for a bit. And um, this really um, kind of linked in with some of the uh, mechanisms of change around mindfulness, which is called decentering. So the idea that if we're completely centred on our thoughts or our emotions, if we're completely that and we're kind of aware of in that moment, then we will react to that, we will respond to that. But if we can decenter ourselves and kind of put our thoughts and emotions over there for a bit, that actually our reactivity to those goes down. So um, that seemed to be what a lot of the patients were describing. And, and they were, the reason it ended up saying in difficult situations um, was because that's when they were using it. They weren't going out and going, I'm going to be mindful of everything. I'm going to start living a mindful life. They were like, oh, I'm really struggling right now. Perhaps I could use some mindfulness in this situation. So it was fairly focused on almost like a first aid. Um, and practitioners were very focused on a behavioural change, um, which actually makes a lot of sense because um, DBT is a behavioural therapy and your targets in DBT are all behaviourally defined. So you're working on reducing life-threatening behaviours, reducing therapy-interfering behaviours, reducing quality of life-interfering behaviours. So all of your outcomes are behaviourally defined. So it kind of makes sense that practitioners would then have the sort of thought that what we want is for mindfulness to change how these people behave. Um, so practitioners were very focused on the idea of what they call DBT kind of like urge surfing. So rather than seeing an urge as um, a signal to, to act, 
that an urge is an urge and an action is an action and you can stay with an urge without going on to your action. Um, so that was quite a lot of what they would talk about, that they would hope that they would see a situation differently and therefore not act on it, or that they would um, be able to tolerate that emotion and therefore not act on it. And that um, kind of tallied up quite well with um, one of the mechanisms of change, which is um, non-attachment to experience. So again, not being so linked into your experience that you then go on to um, react to it. And there's also a mechanism of change in mindfulness, which is non-reactivity. Non so um, it's a bit like the Buddhist monks sitting there for hours on end, and the fly comes in around on their face, and they're not to kind of wipe it away. You're non-reactive to your experience. <coughs> so last um, hierarchical concept was um, approaching awareness with caution. Um, so Maria kind of spoke about this and she um, was probably the least cautious of all of the patients in terms of uh, approaching awareness and she found that um, it made a difference to how she um, dealt with her feelings. So uh, you keep a painful me memory there and sit with it, notice what you're feeling, if it makes you upset that's okay because there's no right or wrong in mindfulness but it's just sitting with it. Whereas before you would not, you would avoid it and push it and push it away. But the thing is, if you keep pushing away, it comes back to bite you on the bum. Sometimes it's uncomfortable to do that. But the more you practice just sitting with that emotion and that memory, that's maybe traumatised you as a child or as an adult, just sitting with it. Not for a long time, but being mindfully aware of what your feeling is, what your feelings are, and what your thoughts are, what your emotions are. So Maria kind of spoke about doing one of the things that practitioners were hopeful that people do, which is just be able to sit with how they were feeling. However, there was a great deal of caution around this. So practitioners um, felt that uh, uh, the patients would be too fragile to manage this. Um, they spoke about uh, being quite fearful that a lot of their patients had been traumatised in some way or were highly emotionally dysregulated. And they were really worried that uh, by putting them in a situation where maybe they were asking them to be aware of their thoughts or their feelings or their body, that that would um, trigger an adverse reaction. So they were worried that um, people might dissociate, they were worried that people might get very, very distressed. And equally, patients didn't speak about that, but they very much spoke about, I'll keep mindfulness here, you know, I'll keep mindfulness with focus attention. Um, they weren't pushing. Maria was probably one of two of them who kind of pushed it that bit further to being like, well, I'm going to sit and I'm going to think of it. You know, I'm going to be aware of this rather than um, avoiding it. Um, and so this got me kind of thinking about um, a couple of things. One is, um, well, perhaps, especially in DBT, which is a very behavioural focused therapy, and and we saw in shifting perspectives in um, difficult situations that it was being effective. You know, people were saying that this is effective for me to change my behaviour. Perhaps that's the work of mindfulness done, and maybe trying to do more than that and trying to enter into emotional experiencing is kind of more than what needs to be done in that situation. Um, however, uh, going back to the kind of research, there's a lot of research for um, symptoms of kind of borderline personality disorder, emotional unstable personality disorder, that actually emotional avoidance is kind of part of the problem, and that kind of, by continually avoiding, that, that increases um, some of the other difficulties. So that you know, sort of talking about being emotion phobic, um, emotion resistant, things like that being a particular problem. Um, and one of the things that um, came up with this was kind of the um, the fear around it. So there was fear on both sides. 
and therefore a bit of a um, standing back. So the practitioners talk specifically about avoiding particular mindfulness exercises because it might cause distress, which then perhaps reinforce a little bit to the patients that this was going to be too much for them and it was kind of oh, a tricky thing to do. Um, and that um, a lot of research has now started to take place in terms of that kind of trauma mindfulness. Should we be using mindfulness for people who are possibly traumatised? And that maybe this benign thing of mindfulness that we're asking everybody to do maybe isn't as benign as people were expecting it to be, and that there may be some adverse effects in terms of increased stress and increased. Um, kind of negative emotions. So there is now some people out there writing about trauma-sensitive mindfulness, mindfulness that takes into account that for some people, when they are asked to be mindful, they do have an adverse reaction because of um, previous difficulties. Uh, so, overall, um, the research kind of got me thinking about that need for trauma sensitive mindfulness and, and what people are fearing in terms of what mindfulness might or might not do. Um, also kind of the need for self-compassion alongside mindfulness. So um, to, in the spectrum of uncertainty that kind of the shame trigger of I'm not good enough to do this and this isn't, I'm doing it wrong. Um, uh, the way I'm thinking is wrong, I shouldn't be having these experiences, all of those sorts of things becoming real blocks to being able to be mindful. Um, so, kind of thinking about, well, if we can be more compassionate about the individual being mindful, rather than just seeing mindfulness as, as X, Y and Z of what you do, then that could be helpful as well. Um, and so, implications for practice. Um, so, understanding mindfulness is multifaceted in its techniques and outcomes. So, kind of knowing what you're doing and why for what individual. So, does this person need better focus attention so they can choose not to think about something that's causing them distress? Or do they need um, greater awareness of their emotions because they need to be able to feel more comfortable with the idea of feeling sad or feeling ashamed or whatever, but being a bit more targeted around well, what are we trying to teach and why, what is the intended outcome, so that um, patients can be clearer, but also practitioners can be clear about well, exactly why we're doing this. Um, knowing when the job of DBT is done um, and when extra benefits from mindfulness practice are outside of the remits of DBT. Um, practitioners uh, being able to consider their own personal influence on the teaching of mindfulness, so being quite aware of some of those maybe fears they've got about types of mindfulness that they do, um, about their confidence in being able to talk about mindfulness as a treatment. Um, and like I said, the addition of self-compassion, um, vulnerability and trauma-sensitive mindfulness practice might be important to the development of mindfulness within DBT. And lastly, limitations. Um, so, like I said, IPA does um, acknowledge that the researcher has a personal influence on the findings, um, and in order uh, to try and uh, make that more robust, you're kind of thinking about how do I use reflexivity, how do I use other people to kind of um, say, well, what about this, how about that, those sorts of things. So, uh, yeah, through the um, supervision that I've had at university, I've been able to kind of try and not be so focused on just what might be apparent to me, but being able to see other things within the research as well. Um, the compromises that I had to make uh, in sampling during recruitment issues did mean that the um, the participants became more and more heterogeneous. You know, they, so therefore, 
in terms of contextualizing it, that becomes more difficult because you're kind of talking, you're not necessarily talking about um, a kind of completely homogeneous group. Um, and as I said at the start, we're always having to take um, IPA findings in, in context and using that to then illuminate or resonate or problem problematize other kind of findings, um, which is kind of the next stage of my research. Thank you.